Welcome to episode 48 of the Non-Fun Gerbils. Today we welcome Giselle Flores to the show. Giselle is not just an artist, she's a visionary who beautifully entwines the realms of traditional and digital art, bringing a unique perspective to her canvas. In today's episode, we journey into the heart of art, exploring its profound connections to life, technology, and the human soul. We delve into the fascinating world of AI in art, discuss the evolving landscape of digital art and NFTs, and even touch on important topics like privacy, security, and the effect of surveillance capitalism on society. Giselle also shares insights into some of her captivating projects, including the Moon Language Project, which is as intriguing as it sounds. Then we conclude with a fun, community-engaging initiative involving all of you, our dear listeners. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this dive into the immersive world of arts and innovation with Giselle Flores. With an So, Giselle, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thanks for having me. It's uh, it's a real pleasure. Just for context, today we've got George here, uh, myself, and Rude Moose. Um, we met originally in New York City for NFT NYC, and uh, we were outside the Cyber Brokers, the Josie Bellini party, and in a group of people, separately chatting and mingling for a while. And there was a lull, and uh, I turned around to you. I didn't know who you were, and I said, uh, "Hi, what's your name?" <laughs> and you're like, "Oh, Giselle," and I was like, "Giselle, the Giselle," <laughs> and I completely <laughs> embarrassed myself because I was like, "Oh my God, hello!" <laughs> <laughs> oh, good times. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was that was an amazing night. So, uh, and you were very, very generously gave me one of your um, fingerprint slides. Um, as part of your your artwork, uh, which so totally fun. blew my mind. I was in costume. I think <laughs> I think we were. I was going to cosplay from of my character. Um, that's really fun. Yeah, the the physical piece. It, it's I've 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 gifted physical pieces throughout the years um, of three different collections. Uh, and and um, all linked to everybody I met in person. So you're then blessed by one of those uh, physical pieces, which is really cool that you have that. It's a very much a case of right place, right time, and sort of lucky dip of saying hello to people, which is so much fun. So we normally start and we ask someone to introduce themselves. But I think maybe today we'll change that because I think we're going to cover art today. And maybe you could help us understand what art is. and. Tell us what the definition of art is to you. Ooh, that's a that's a big one. That's a big one to start with. <clears throat> Can I just introduce myself? No, I'm just. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, art! Art is life. Art is the way we process life. Art is products of the human soul. Is um, ways we regurgitate our experiences, share it with others. It lives in this kind of nebula of uh, of expression of humans, uh, I would say. I'd like to say I completely understand, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's very ethereal. Uh, yeah, I, I've been in a very ethereal uh, part of my life. I want to say uh, it's it's a quite surreal. Um, being in this stage, you know, I've, I've been an artist, self-proclaimed, I would say, for almost 20 years. Uh, I did go to art college, uh, which kind of helped me feel like I could say that somehow, even though it, it's not necessary, of course. Um, but for me, it was because I really wanted to get to the root of what conceptual art could be or what, you know, it, it really drawed me in um, when I was in high school. <clears throat> because I, I loved painting 
since I was a little child and I had been, you know, I was able to oil paint on the weekends at this Cuban school that was like near my house. And I was able to be there for almost 10 years, which was amazing. Just going on the weekends and painting, oil painting, acrylics and everything uh, from a little bit from life, but mostly uh, from pictures, like recreations of things. And this, um, the artist Dalia Condi, she was very like traditional in, in the sense of like landscape is art and, you know, um, you know, painting, you know, figures of historical figures and, and symbolisms and whatnot is art. That's one, that's one side of art that I really was into for a long time. But then I realized that there's, what is like, what is this conceptual? What is this Rauschenberg? What are these like John Cage, you know, music? What is this like um, other era or, or like eras of art or t like almost categories of art that are indescribable in a way? Um, so I took it upon myself to kind of learn many aspects of art throughout those years and, and from everything from sculpture to, uh, to digital art really early around 2003, um, 2002 computer works and photography just started around that time for me. Um, yeah, but that's kind of where I've always been headed is like, where, what is art? Why it's not just a pretty picture. How do we get past, like, what is past a pretty picture in art and how do we, and who does that respond to and who responds to it? I find those who respond to my art, uh, just naturally are, are fascinating people to me because I feel like many people don't, don't just jump into the art that I do because it's, it is very pretty offhand, very easy to like be drawn in, but then uh, conceptually, like how it's taken and um, what I'm actually like working with, with these light paths, at least with the last few years of work with transmission of light and different projects I'm working on. So is, a, is, a, is an ape with a rare hat and some cool glasses art, would you say? Oh, come on. What a bait question. <laughs> <clears throat> Depends on who you speak to. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, that's the right answer, right? That's the right answer. That's, yeah, that's what art of is. Of course. Right? It, it, you know, it's an illustration. If you want to start there, illustration is quite, you know, it's a type of art of some sort, <laughs> an ape of whatnot. But, uh, you know, it's, that's, that's another level. That's another, um, another brush in the tools of web three and where art is going in web three. I think there's many levels to that. There's, you know, the, the clickbait level, which is very, um, in your face and, and really bright and shiny and, and, you know, easy to collect. And, uh, and then there's, um, you know, poetic elements or different, um, variations of art on this, in this new path of web of the web three world. Uh, there's collections. Yeah. It's how, it's how, how it interacts with that community or as they call it, <laughs> um, in different, in different groups. Uh, you know, many of those are, are involved in, in many different ways, like investing and, and, uh, you know, gamers and there's, so many groups of audiences that are mixing in this world that that really set it differently, set it apart from other art worlds. Yeah, so, uh, so I'm trying. I've been trying to understand what art is, and and w would it be? Is it too limiting to say it's it's the expression of creativity? Expression of creativity, yeah, because I think even. Oh, wow. Expression of life more so because creativity is like an aspect of our lives, but I don't think art is born of creativity. It's like creativity is the, the, the way it's expressed, but what you're expressing is the real art and what is making you do this art. That's why I say the soul, you know, cause it's like, that's going to be the biggest difference between AI and, and, you know, how we use AI is, is really important to keep yeah. track on the soul. Like where, where's the soul and what do we want to do? <laughs> what are we actually expressing here? Um, and how do we want to live our lives? Yeah. Ca can an AI actually generate art? Is that what it's creating or is it just creating images? 
or, or maybe the maybe it's the regurgitating point. images of our past. It's a constant regurgitation of our past. This is what people have to realize. But um, the regurgitation is like it's like the human aspect of of us mixing and matching, like we do, but without the element of the new of like what we add to these things. Like um, we're constantly lo- learning and growing in our timelines. Like AI is constantly learning and growing from all of our timelines. Okay. <laughs> but we still have to be the, we are still the, the sparks. Uh, I, I like to say, cause that's kind of where my work comes from is, is that idea of that spark and that, and the intent Intent is such a huge word that I think people really have to focus on. It's like, what do we intend, you know, with what we're creating? And and because AI is our is a new is a new arm of who we are. It's like a new extension of our of our body in a way. It's like this global brain that is regurgitating all that we have, and we can specify with all the constraints, you know, what we are finding in that data like what what we want to find in that like it's great because it it opens up so many doors of data that we haven't ever had access to so it is mind-blowing but that's where we have to really like okay now we have the knowledge of the world at our fingertips what do you want to do with it um and how are we gonna you know progress as a society with it those are the cool questions it's so cool that we get straight into this. Um, let's let's hear a little bit about you. Um, can you tell us your background? Uh, my background, uh, again, art, art uh, has kind of been my passion throughout. Uh, always animals too. I love nature and science. Um, uh, after we already spoke a little bit about college, I went to RISD um, and I work with a lot of the alumni too, kind of working with the affinity groups and kind of keeping this communication alive uh, of everybody that's passed through those gates of, of arts uh, education in that way. And then I started a photography towards the last year of that time with Henry Hornstein. He was like a big inspiration of mine, uh, black and white, really classic still life, you know, silver, silver prints, you know, just super traditional, uh, Um, photographer that really inspired me to go into photography because I really liked all kinds of art and I didn't really know where I wanted to go until I really started realizing that um, the lenses of photography were giving me this detail and quality that I really was pursuing with paint beforehand because I really loved the details but I was making paintings that were very um, spatial space space oriented my favorite paintings towards the end were like these black like all black with some like orbs and and like shooting stars and things and I found like different illustrations I would repaint um that were these actually molecular illustrations um that felt like space to me so I I started painting those and now you know so many years later (laughs) I find finally like I'm speaking a a language that I was looking for back then. And now it's through photography, which is so cool. So uh, I've been working the last two years on a project called Moon Language, uh, taking photographs of the moon in a way where I dance with the moon. And it's like this communication uh, that I, this connection that I have with the moon throughout the last few years. Um, And I'm building in a way it's like, Along with Platonic Mind, a musician that's a that's a beautifully trained musician that is working with each moon, um, and it's going to be 968 moons, uh, all with a tone of each one, and um, and we're working with different frequencies, different like healing thoughts, and, and seeing this as a collection of a, of a whole um, new language like like the letters are almost the pieces of a, of a new type of um, alphabet, uh, I would say, where it's like almost a thousand pieces, but each one has a tone associated with it. Um, and I really uh, have, have these dreams and visions of seeing this in a planetarium or in a dome. And like, I kind of am starting to figure out how to work with this as an installation. 
So coming soon, we're, we're seeing like a lot of things develop with it as the, as the music um, is being developed. And I, and I really want to hear them play in, in the variations uh, where it depends on the composer that's putting the sounds together and see how it will affect people and the, and the audiences and, and, and play with different um, aspects of that. And there's a few more things I want to say, but I, I like don't want to give too much away yet. Like there's so it's such a baby of mine and I don't even <laughs> I can't wait to share stuff, though. Wow. I am super excited to hear how excited you are about this, Giselle, like just seeing and hearing your passion. I I would like to know more. I know you said you are not ready to share, but how can we prepare like what, what's a do you have a timeline when will we be able to learn more um timelines where it's going to be in the new year we are the close. sounds are the sounds are developing definitely into the new year um i am working on <laughs> there's I know it's, it's like there, there's such a beauty to it. How do I even describe it? It's like um, they're stills. They're all photography based. So it's all a photography based collection. Some of them have a metadatas where they're layered with the transmissions of light, which is another, which is the series that I've been working on previously to these, uh, where it's taking the lights of New York City and blending them mm-hmm. together. Um, and, and blending them in a way that is like of a time and place. You're just like sourcing these, these light forms and, and dancing with them in the same way that I dance with the moon as well. So it, it's kind of like the next variation of this, kind of like of the past kind of coming into this future work. Um, and that will only be in a certain amount of, of pieces because I, I wouldn't do a thousand by hand, um, you know, physically um, composing them and, and making them beautiful. So, <clears throat> but there will be a select few of those. Um, everything is going to have a quote associated. I'm finding and sourcing many quotes from female inventors and creators of the past and seeing how they were so how they were connected with the moon. So I, I've used AI in a few ways in this project. One being uh, sourcing a lot of the poetics behind them in a way where it's just finding different quotes of, of creators throughout the past and seeing how how their message of the moon resonated for their inspirations into what they did to change the the trajectory of the world and and to see, you know, how common it is throughout history uh, for everyone to have an association and a connection and a personal understanding of the moon with them. Um, when you say dancing with the moon, uh, there was a, a moment at the, the Trevor Jones's castle party this year uh, during the fireworks where, um, and I think Metageist caught a video of it where you were taking photos of the fireworks, but you were really dancing with it and it was for the people that were behind and saw they were like i know they stopped watching the fireworks they're all watching you because that was fascinating the way that you were moving and capturing these photos so yeah yeah, i'm i'm imagining it being something like that oh fine yes uh you know it's kind of like like um it's it's become a, a certain art form in a way it's like i i i adjust everything manually so it's like a really Jar, like it's almost like a jarring process because I'm working with this manual Leica, but it's got everything manual. I don't use automatic lenses um, because I really love the challenge of being at an event or being at, in, a, in a situation like that where I'm recording something I really want to capture. Um, but having the, the added challenge of being able to focus it on point where you want it and like where you and how to grasp it with with the right shutter speed and, and uh, aperture depending on the the situation is really a fun challenge that I've had throughout all the years of working uh, with my camera. Um, I used to shoot a lot of concert photography as well. Um, And I would also try to make that stuff move because what a boring concert shot that's like clear and sharp and that nothing's happening. Like you don't, you don't have music to make you feel like you're there. 
So I've always been, um, you know, a proponent of like making, putting action into the still. And same for all of my still life photography for the 20, 20 years I've been doing mostly primarily still life photography for jewelry and watches and like uh, handbags. And um, I love small brands doing, doing it for small brands because that's much more fulfilling. It's like almost a, it's, it's become such a, such a second nature for me. Like, like I, when I was shooting the concerts, it's like I shot for a while for NPR, like doing a lot of uh, all tomorrow's parties. I did that even with, with my babies were like, just like one of my babies was just born. She was like a few weeks old and we went out, and I'm like shooting these concerts, like <laughs> just like. <laughs> like strapped usual in a, strapped in a baby bjorn <laughs> yeah yeah you know like little feeding breaks every once in a while in the car um you know so it, it's it's always um fun and dynamic as something i've always tried to kind of keep in my work regardless of what it's for um so it's it feels like that when i'm shooting and and actually you know like when you have a performer on stage and they're like really into the music that they that they do these weird like twitches and things like i feel like that's kind of what happens to me when i get in the mode of photography like if i'm in the zone i'm like really like i won't feel i won't hear anything i won't see anything like i am just like there trying to capture it. but so that that was really cool event the castle party with trevor jones oh my god i had a great time it was wonderful I got really cool shots of those fireworks and I hadn't really shot fireworks in that way before. That was the kind of first and it really gave me another nice aha moment. That's like, Whoa, wow. I want to do this and and make, make more worlds, more pods. I keep I'm making these environments through um, been minting on mint gold dust, a lot of cool, uh, really strange um, environments. One being a really macro video interactive 360 fingerprint that is like that is really uh you got to see it there's like rainbows going on and you're like in my finger and it's like you're so close you're like basically like <laughs> it's touching your eye um so and and <laughs> and the piece i got and one of the main pieces i got from that trevor jones event uh with meta guys shooting me shooting like it um there's a the the piece on Super Bear. They let me see, the piece I have on there. <clears throat> we'll link this it in the came, show notes. Let me. I know. I wish I could like show a little clip. Or... No, it's good. It's good if we can see it, right? Because then we can actually uh, connect nice? with it. This is the first time we've done a screen share in a podcast. Hey, oh yeah, there we go. Hello. There we go. Wow. So the piece that came out of the Trevor Jones Castle Party that really I really wanted to share. Um, Quite after, it was also inspired that with the event I went to right after, which was the Ginsburg poetry event of the Verse Verse in New York City. There was two events that that really solidified this piece for me on Super Rare called Victorious. And with the fireworks, with the way that the fireworks were moving, I worked on this piece. And it's just a simple, it's a simple mirror, but it's what it's what it represents to me that I think really... Uh, gets me and um, it, it it's a big v and this is at a time where like we were at we're we're like not even seeing the bull sparks of any bull run it's like I'm, i feel like i minted it at like the most non-victorious time <laughs> to be posting something like this but i felt like i needed like we all needed like a little bit of hope we all need hope and, and to be celebrating the wins as they are, you know, even in the, in the darkest times, you really have to look back and be thankful for where you've, where you've come and like to be able to see the wins that, that have come uh, in time, you know, within your timeline. Um, so I thought back and I'm like, you know, like Web3 is not dead. Like, sure, NFTs maybe died because they all said they died and, you know, and everybody's like lost the values of things. But but that doesn't mean that our communities like changed or gone because it's like we were all still building. We're all still making. I'm still super inspired by making every day. And I see so many artists that are also continuing to create, continuing to build. We just had we had just had a, a zero one, the zero one come into the scene, which was super fun. And we all got excited again with art. Um, so this piece is about being victorious, is about celebrating the wins that, that happen and what can be drawn from that. 
I love it. It definitely, yeah. it definitely evokes that feeling. I think it also reflects the Castle Valley itself, right? The, the vibe that was going on there. And just the description, we are, is like, we are victorious. We are, um, we have, we have, we have um, made, you know what? I have a poem that goes with it. Let's see if I can find it. I, I posted about it and it's so funny how things get kind of lost. <laughs> <laughs> like context gets lost if you, if you um, don't have everything, you know, within the metadata of everything. Mm. So there, there's some really fun, you know, challenges with that coming up, but I see some platforms working with it. Um, there's some platforms kind of adding notes later on to pieces. Do you know about this? No, I haven't seen that. I feel like that's a very good idea, though, because as you continue to build the story, like it makes sense to add that on and add the context so that way people, while they interpret it you know, in their own ways, can also see where the artist was going with it. If you remember back in the day, Scribe with Conlon... Uh, I used to scribe my NFTs. I have a few NFTs out there that are scribed as well, where we had to actually use a, you know, a gas, a gas um, transaction to even put it in there. And like, it was, it was really at the worst time. <laughs> <laughs> People's gas exchanges is like a hundred dollars or something crazy. So it was, it was a wild experimentation, um, but it's in the blockchain and it's there, which is pretty fun very early on. Um, and I think there's Mint Gold Dust is trying to do something similar, I think. And also Transient Labs is working on some like a memento type from what I hear. So being able to add to add to it over time. Yeah. Yeah, that's oh, really Oh, I find my poem. Almost. This was like the pre-poem. This is a, a non fungible exclusive now. We're getting the pre poem that was never I released. I know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. I should go into this one now. Um, there's so many pieces I've been making lately, so it's just wild. Okay. There's a lot to share, and everything is like interlinked. So, with this super rare piece, Victorious, there's a poem that goes with it. It's actually pinned on my Twitter. We see beyond what is fed. We create new economies. We connect collectively. We build accessible infrastructure. We strive for peace and autonomy. We value provenance and heart. Victorious we are on super rare. Very this nice. Is, this is what made me want to make that piece and made me yeah, feel Yeah, they're beautiful like, words. Thank you. Uh, it, and, it, you know, the Ginsburg event of the po poetics that were going on, it, it was really Eye-opening, um, seeing uh, there was like a preview of A Weiwei that he did. And it was a, of, um, I think it was actually banned from being in the show later on. Uh, so I, I don't think it was actually released, but we got to see this really cool preview that made me think of like our freedoms and where, and where we are and how, you know, how, how much is going on that we can't control, uh, but we have to kind of, we have to all stick together and find ways to, to make things better out there. Why was it banned? Mm -hmm. Ah, it's about war, the bombs. It's about bombs and whatnot. So, and uh, it really uh, it moved me because it was projected on all four walls in this event. It was huge, and seeing it was right. I think it was after, it, like the Ukraine war had already started, but the one the Israeli one. And this was like kind of right in between that and seeing this, I think maybe the first few days of the other war was just starting. It needs to be seen. And I, I can't believe it's, it's being quieted um, because people it's affecting it, so many people around the world. Censorship is a big, it's a big issue oh. at the moment, right? Censorship is, I can't believe how much control there actually is with censorship. You know, I, I didn't have my eyes open till this past few years. I think many of us uh, got our eyes open the last few years of how much is how much is censored, how much is being shut shut out. Mm. Yeah. Well, you've been. Uh, I happen to know that you've been uh, on a bit of a privacy uh, and security journey recently. Um, what's? Um, can you tell us about that at all? The journey, the journey is ongoing. It's a constant, it's a constant journey of, of finding, you know, ways to be more secure, um, and how to not be 
feel like we're all being spied on. You know, that that the thought that data is being harvested from us and data has value and that value is just being extracted to it from us is just ridiculous. So I, I don't um I don't agree with a lot of the technology the way it's been um addressed or or um dispersed. <laughs> mm. You know, all those AOL CDs we used to get in the mail as junk. <laughs> like, I don't know if anybody remembers that, but I do. Uh, oh, yeah. And 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 thinking like, oh, it's free. Yeah, it's free. But what do they want? You know, it's like now, twenty years later, we're seeing like the the repercussions of of giving all our data. And now people are giving their eye scans and things. I don't like. We don't. How about we don't agree to these things? How about we don't um, buy any phones that have this? The problem is that that all the phones are having this. So this is the situation. Where's the, the where's the front runner that's going to jump out and be different? Because those are the ones we want we want to jump on board with. Absolutely. I presume you've read um, uh, Shoshana Zuboff's The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. No, but I'd like to. <laughs> oh, man. It's, it's, it's the ultimate book on this subject, I think, <laughs> at, least the, at least that George and I have read. Yeah, it's very powerful. Um, I will check it out. Don't, yeah, if you, yeah, don't read it if, if, it, <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you find this kind of thing really spooky because it gets a lot spookier. <laughs> Um, oh, when you spooky. dig in, well, like, like, like you know, um, it, there, there's some very interesting bits of it which discusses, you know, a company's trying to actually sort of um, uh, incentivize people to move in a particular way. So, you know, at the moment, you go around your daily life and you give off data in different ways, and then companies begin to think, well, well, what if we could, what if we could uh, make them go in a particular direction? Uh, that we want them to go in. So so it, it changes from sort of surveillance in terms of watching what people do to actually meddling in people's lives to make them do a particular thing. And that and that's actually where Pokemon Go came from. I don't know if you remember yeah. that strange thing where everyone was walking around. Uh, that was a that was actually a, a, an experiment oh. to see whether they could make people go in a particular direction. Um, and then what you can do is you can auction, you can auction off to companies in real time whether you want people to turn left or right into your shop or not. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> what is yeah. that last part? <laughs> well, um, it, it, imagine you put a Pokemon Go in in a in a McDonald's doorway instead of a Burger King doorway. Yes. Um, and what if you auctioned that possibility in real time? Oh yeah. my god. Okay, I see. Based on demographic. Oh, auctioning. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I it's like, you know, the the idea of um techno feudalism killed capitalism, I think is the the book name that I'm that I'm working on. Exactly that, like the thought of like the how we're slaves to the cloud uh, in a way we're the way we're paying monthly for absolutely everything. I mean, I just I mean, why are we paying monthly for absolutely everything going on in our lives? Like, it doesn't make sense. And every app is trying to charge monthly. Um, how is this? Like, where are we going with this? You know, like, why are why are we giving this way? And, and why is it all structured in the way to take it all from us monthly? <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a this question. is a real problem. And it's the whole world is going through this, like, money transfer that's really different than it ever was it's the it's the trojan horse of convenience um i think that's that's the thing it's it's dressed it's all dressed up like your life is going to be easier um and, and then you, you can know, never just... access your photos because they're in this cloud that's owned by google you can never access your photos because it's in the apple thing that doesn't even down help you download it like it doesn't even let you help you download <laughs> When, when you get a certain amount of photos in your phone, have any of you had troubles downloading all of them? I mean, I sure have. <laughs> it's like, they, it should be illegal. These things should not be possible. Uh, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't release the app if you can't have a way to download all the photos, you know, that are possible on that phone. It just, there, there should be quality control on so many of these things that are not. Yeah, I took, I took all my photos off Google a few years ago. And uh and they didn't give them all to me, uh, but they said they had. 
and wow. and because it gave you the the uh, the metadata files with it, I could see what was missing, and then manually search. I had to manually search for the missing <sighs> photos and videos from Google. So I'm I'm all out of that. That's uh, and yeah. and you are technically you know gifted. There's so many people that can't even do any of this at all and they just lose everything constantly you know then they pay forever so that they can see children their their photos of their kids when they were little now there's now they're they're chained forever for their lives like blood you know like we're giving it out like blood now we have this like it's just it's just we have to stop the bloodshed on many levels actually so. yeah <laughs> i suppose they will they it, it, the counter argument is that people most people aren't technically responsible enough to look after their photos and not lose them. And so the argument the other way is that, that most people would be better off using these cloud services uh, and paying for it with think, their blood. Yeah. <laughs> and, they, and they don't have to teach you. They don't have to teach you, right? Because it doesn't serve them to teach you how to do yeah. it. So yeah. it won't ever ser- if it doesn't ever serve them, they won't ever teach us how to do these things and continue in the slavery. You know, continue in the in the uh, <laughs> in the ser- servants. You know, indentured servant way that like would do that. So it's just um, just our our how do we how do we manage this? You know, how, it's a huge problem for society. I think. I suppose you're um, they're incentively uh, they're incentivized to have a user base which is not technical and not learning how to be technical um, and how to take responsibility. And and how convenient is that, you know, and how funny um, where anybody, so, so basically we have to teach it in school somehow to have, to be responsible of file management. <laughs> it's something that I'm actually really passionate about because I had to deal with the, with photographers shooting film and I was helping them convert to digital back in the day. So I was helping them with proving to them that digital files are as um, resilient as film would be, which is hard because it's a, in a glitch, you have no photo, you know? So it's like, it's not that easy to, to, to be that person. And it's not that easy to translate it, you know, to translate, um, to be that person to not only educate um, the photographer, and how to work more responsibly, but also then um, in the post. So, um, but you have to teach us because this is our future. And and crypto is all about remembering this stuff and and having ways that are not going to fail you later on. Like to keep those seed phrase, you know, words somewhere. You have to be really responsible, and we have to be really organized. But this is something that we have to teach from children. Uh, to help them later on, because this is going to be even crazier 20 years from now. Because I don't see any solutions and I don't see people looking for the solutions either for these governments, for these corporations that have turned into governments, essentially. It's, it's, t- it's totally true, actually. And, and it all ties into the same thing. You know, the, the, the essence of what is decentralization and Bitcoin and, and self-sovereign money and responsibility over finances and things and technology um you know why isn't why isn't uh accounting taught throughout school education and, and uh, the understanding of how to manage money and and what money actually is i mean if everyone knew what fiat money was then there'd be a revolution mm-hmm. maybe it's coming they knew what was behind it yeah they're starting to learn i think uh, <laughs> you can't keep deleting information i don't know (laughs) or can they (laughs) ai is really going to be really strong that's the that's the problem ai is going to go is going to be used for censorship and this is the problem (laughs) yeah we've got the ai wars coming right the ai that's for um freedom and the ai for oh not freedom what are we going to do? Um, so, yeah, no, actually, I came into this space uh, through my son, which was just playing a game on, on his iPad. And, and I, he, was, he was imitating our real life uh, art world, which was um, inviting uh, artists to our space once a month in Williamsburg in Brooklyn. We were having art salons and um, showing off artworks of all the friend artists that we knew at the time and, and having, you know, space to come together and to t- talk about art for fun. 
Um, and they, my son was doing it on his iPad with this game called Animal Jam. And he was, he had all his artworks that he was making and put it in as items in his den and had people over and started trading for like alpha items. And, and he started telling me he got a special item because of his artwork. And I'm like, what? That's value. That's a value trade. Like how do, what, how can we do this as, you know, as, um, adults, like there has to be a digital value currency, right? Like how have they not developed, this is right when I started re researching into web three, which was around 2018. Um, so it, it was like, you know, what, how do we find this economy? You know, how do we find this economy of value exchange for artists? And this is what really brought me here so early on. And I've been kind of obsessed ever since. And since coming to the space, what have, what's been the upside um, versus the downside? The upside is infinite leads and infinite um, audiences, infinite like connections with humans of all places of anywhere. That is priceless. I don't know. That's like, for me, that's living and that's like learning and, and kind of learning this new conversations, communications, ways to speak to others around the world artworks that I've been to able to collaborate with like many different women for Woka, for the women of crypto art. Uh, that's on async, which is sadly shutting down, I think. But our tarot deck will live on because every day forever is going to be still drawing the first, the original, drawing a new reading every day. It, it still does this. This is something that it's been doing for years and it will live on in the Ethereum blockchain. The, the sad thing that the platform uh, that's, you know, so interactive and so cool, I guess, is, is shutting down, but um, the NFTs will live on and they'll continue. But the experiences that have come through these collaborations and, and these, um, these projects are just like, you don't forget these things and, and they go on forever. Mm. Yeah. Oh, man. Async. I mean, that's a rabbit. That's a, that's a <laughs> thing. It's very sad. Mm -hmm. So, so what are the downsides? Um, are there any downsides? Uh, what are the, or maybe maybe the pitfalls that, that people we talked about? Work? You know, if you want the huge downside being being you know security, like we're saying, uh, security of of like knowing all your passwords and knowing where you're keeping everything and how to keep it safe from fires and you know redundancy and and whatnot that you have to take care of. Um, not clicking on random links. Ooh, I had recently, I almost fell for one recently that, and it's just like, you're getting these emails for people saying they're going to interview you for something. And then you, you know what? It's like, huh, what is this? My offer? There's like, you know, there's little hints here and there saying, is this a scam? Is this not a scam? Like, what is this? Like, why is this particular wording or, you know, this, like, is this specific to me or not? You have to really be like, like with magnifying glasses and like constantly checking if, you know, if they reach you on one platform, you better check on another platform if it's the same person. Cause it's like, yeah. you better find out about these things. Cause you can't, you can't, you can't be stupid about, um, and just like nonchalant about, uh, right. plenty of people I know have been hacked. There's like plenty of ways it can happen. Um, you try to keep as, as safe as you can. Yeah. And that's why I'm saying it's an ongoing process of learning uh, safety. And I'm constantly asking people what they're doing because that helps. It helps and it's constantly changing. The every What we know now, two weeks later, is different. Yeah, this is why I like it when people share when they've been, when they've had an incident or they've had an almost incident. You have to share that because because people need to know and we all need to be paying attention and updating our internal models so that we're looking out for it and being... Reminded. Yeah, absolutely. And share who, who helped because that's always wonderful to keep on track is like to kind of have a memory or record of like who who helps in those situations because you probably want to find some some like other hacker that will hack back or find a way to get it back. <laughs> you know, you want to you want those people on your side. So. Mm. So do you have any tips, let's say, uh, for two categories of people, maybe the existing artist who who wants to um, break into this NFT type space, and then maybe um, what would you say to you know the teenage you coming up, or maybe maybe even before that, you know the early artist who hasn't quite discovered they're an artist yet, but they like making things, um, and and where to go with that? 
tiered. I would start with the artist wanting to do art. Um, I would start from there and, and always try to paint from life and always try to make art from life when you're starting. Cause there's this, cause there's actually like a muscle recognition between your hand and your eye that, that develops over time. It's like a muscle. It's like a workout. Like you, like it's like a workout with your eyeballs, like drawing from life. So that helps you see your reality in front of you. Cause you, you can't even imagine how many people just are living out of their imaginations. Like they're literally, because they've, if they're going to recreate something that they saw, they will recreate the, the memory of it versus what they actually are looking at. Even if it's in front of them, we're just naturally prone to just having an imagination thought, like an icon almost of, of thought, which we visualize and manifest into whatever we're showing. But it's usually like, it's funny because it's always like, like if you draw a face, it's always like two eyes, a nose and a mouth. But if you see the face, it's like sideways and it's like, you know, totally different. So <laughs> you can, so anyways, drawing from life is a huge, um, big skill asset to win, especially in times of this digital era where everything is so digital. Even if you're drawing from life on your iPad, still looking at something. So then for the, for the web three world, um, Twitter is still a major player, I think I have to say, even though there's plenty of other ways to have networking going on. There's like a lot of things developing like DECA and a few other ways for people to come together. But Twitter is kind of the main streak for me is that where I see a lot of updates and a lot of things going on. What I would suggest really strongly is to not um, follow anybody that isn't in the scene or to just make an account that's dedicated to this and to the art and to the, if you're an artist and you want to be in the web three scene, it's so specific that you want the algorithm to work with you. So you have to teach the algorithm what you want it to do. This is with all your socials. I feel like kids in general should know this because it's like, if you start going <laughs> clicking well. on stuff, even if you're curious, do it from another account. So it doesn't ruin your, your like, your algorithm because it'll change. So like whatever you click on, whatever you look on is going to be factored into this algorithm. So like if you use it for marketing, you want to like have all the people you want to market to. So like what art institutions do you like? You know, what, um, what groups of people do you resonate with? Only follow those. Great. Yeah. Great advice. Um, I was thinking there when you said um, paint from life, um, George and I were at, at in Lisbon for NFC this year. I think you are as well. Saw you yes. briefly. Um, and we went to a party and there was a, a sketch artist there. Um, and I don't know if you had this same experience, George, but man, that guy, the way he looked at me whilst he was painting oh. me on an iPad, re it really took me back. Cause I sat down and was like, right, okay, yeah, this will be fun. He's going to, and it's going up on a screen live as he's doing it. But I've never been pierced <laughs> by someone's eyes like that before. And it was it was sort of partially unnerving, but also deeply like touching in wow. in a bizarre way, which I would, was not expecting at <laughs> this party. Uh, did you get that as well, George? Yeah, I I mean now that you mention it, I do I do remember the piercing gaze. Um but I remember thinking to myself, I guess this is how they do it. Because <laughs> they're having to capture <laughs> They're having to capture, you know, my nose and my, you know, whatever it is, and and it is an incredible skill when you see them do it, and you look, you look at what they've done, and you can tell it's you, but it's like a totally weird characterization of you, um, but somehow they've still managed to capture the essence, and I imagine that that comes through the piercing gaze. Um, that's mm. how they do it, um, and it and it is a very special skill to be able to do that, um, and. And I sometimes think, you know, um, wow, it, if if I knew I had that skill and I knew that the Web3 world existed and the NFT world, I think I'd, I think I'd you know, be doing my best to try and get myself involved in some way because um, there, so there is so much skill involved potentially. I, I, I guess that, that might lead on to another question about, about skill and time and effort and energy and creativity. Because we have such tools now that effectively allow us to shortcut that. And 
And the question is whether the market can tell and still value time, effort, and energy. I, I have a, a great friend of mine who's an unbelievable watercolor artist, and he's building a, uh, 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 I guess, a, a project around doing NFTs. And, and really the, the amount of time and energy and effort he's put in throughout his life to honing that skill. But I can recreate one fairly quickly on mid-journey that looks very close. Um, and, and, and I guess my, que my question is, do we, f do we feel like we're going to be able to curate ourselves in such a way whereby we can delineate between the two? And should we? And is one more valuable than the other? Um, and does it then become all about the story of the artist who's producing the art? Because that's where the value lies, because there is no story in creating something on mid-journey. Sorry, I'm chucking a few a few tennis balls at you at the same time, see if you can catch one. But um. they're great questions. They're they're great, they're great questions. Um, you know, it goes with the thought of of just a pretty picture, the idea of like uh <laughs> Mid journey is the ultimate at making the pretty picture, right? It's like, or, or what they would say is pretty. Um, can you train, can you get a, a watercolor um, in the same way as that artist? Maybe, maybe, but what that artist is doing throughout their life. It's, and it's not just the story of the artist, I think, that what makes it valuable. I think it's, it's an actual trajectory of the, what that artist is going through in their lives um, and what they're making out of that. So will that watercolor artist be a relevant artist? We don't know yet. It depends on, on what kind of statement they make and, and how much connection they have with others, I guess. Um, if it's something that I, I also worry, you know, I've worried about it for a while because still life photography kind of went out the door when people got phones. So it's like, <laughs> you know, people are like, oh, wait, the sun is a great, is a great light. I don't have to buy all this equipment like I have back here. You know, you don't, you don't need lighting. You can just like take a snap it with your phone and you got your still life shot. Um, I think it works for some things. I think it, the, the, it's going to be, you know, I feel really bad for concept artists because I feel like that, like, not that I feel bad for them. Okay, this is almost interesting. It's so, so interesting because I'm almost editing myself as I'm speaking because it's like the concept artist is going to be the one pulling the constraints on mid journey, you know, like that because they already have studied um, composition. So they will know when a mid journey comes out properly or not. Like, it's like those decisions are going to be more important. The fact that mid journey cuts corners in technique, I think, is going to be tricky for the artists that we're working commercially a lot, because I see almost every corporation using is going to use mid journey in this way to not have to pay people. It's sad because it's just going to, I think, look look lame. It's going to make marketing look even worse than it already was. <laughs> like so, will that be successful or not for them? Probably not. We'll see. Um, we'll see if that if that helps their their uh, bottom lines or whatnot. Um, but I think there's always going to be a need for soul and art and and poetry and, and this like you know expression of other uh, that people resonate with. I think uh, digital art can be manifest in in huge things like the Las Vegas sphere now that we see with a uh, you know writ uh, and doll and so. It can be impactful and huge or, or is like that little, you know, the little canvas that you found in this one, like, you know, strange place that has the most curious thing on it and you can't describe it, but you keep it on your, your shelf all day and every day and you think of it every day because you look at it. I don't know. It, that's going to be there with you forever. Like that's a connection to an artwork forever. So like, well, what resonates? What, what's going to resonate with people? What's going to matter? Who knows? Who cares? <laughs> by, by then. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. We, we, we had a conversation and the, the upshot of the conversation was, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll spend a bit more time on the making of. You know, I'll spend a bit more time, you know, with my drawings and all the concepting that goes into one of my pieces because that's something that Mid Journey can't copy. 
It can't copy the fact that I've I have this this backstory to this piece of work, and you know here was my initial concepting, here was my initial drawing, you know here's me with all, and it felt like a fix, but it also felt like it also felt like quite sad that mm. that, that you have to shine a light on the history of the piece as it's being made in order to communicate that it's real and from the heart. Mm. Um, rather than just being able to see a piece and go, wow, that's, you know, that's beautiful or it does something. And, and, and then I guess the question then is, well, what if, what if I do feel all those feelings and it is from mid journey? <laughs> what if I do see this thing and it really inspires me and I find it amazing and powerful? And, I think and... it could, I think it could, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't see that. And that's not, and you shouldn't be ashamed. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it, hasn't, it, fair, it, hasn't ha- it hasn't happened to me yet. It hasn't happened to me yet. But I'm sure, oh, I'm sure. Sh- I'm sure it will. <laughs> hey, you know, there's all the collectors of generative art. Come on. It's like, it's yeah. not going to, it's not, uh, it, it's, of course, I don't know. We're, we're going to respond to things made by whatever. So it's going to, that's why it either works or it doesn't. Who's behind it? That's the question. That's what I would think right away. It's like, you know, the artist is going to shine eventually throughout the pieces, like throughout time. And, you know, you're, you're going to be like, oh, of course it was that person behind this. Like, you, you know, that, like, that's how you know it's a really great artist. Like when there's somebody that like, you, you see it right away and you might know it's them. You probably know it's them, but you're not sure. But then you kind of figure something else out about it. And it's clever in a way that's like only that artist would do. I think that's still, it's still going to happen. And I think, um, in a way, artists are becoming more celebrity in a way, like the way uh, musicians have been for a long time. I think art is going to be um, more celebrated with pe- with groups of people, groups of individuals, like seen as more like rock star type things as uh, the way music was for so has been for so long. Um, but artists were never really attributed like living artists were never really in the culture. I feel like it was only just for, you know, Pepsi and commercial rights and commercial things where artists got to shine, like some artists got to shine, but like, it's so manipulative and like the whole point of it sucks. So <laughs> just sell something. Um, so that's like not art at all. And, and then you, then it's like everything going on in, in the galleries in New York city. And there's so much, so much beautiful art, even in Milan, like I went recently and it's like, so many beautiful things uh, that you can't describe unless you're there physically looking at it and, and it changes you. And, and that's one, one thing of that, the stare, going back to the idea of, the, of this cartoon artist that's like staring into your soul. That's, that's something, that's electric, that's electric. It made, you feel, it made you feel something and they're grabbing something from you. <laughs> by by drawing it you know they are they're getting that essence and they're connecting with that essence and this is not even like physical like not physical but it is physical i wonder if you can do them with with uh virtually you know that's an interesting question for that for cartoon artists like do they yeah. feel the the same feelings that's my would be my question because a lot of my work is about that like it's about this like these sparks that happen unseen that you don't know when you're like in the room with somebody else, you can, I can feel them. I feel their like presence. And that does, that's really interesting. The thought of staring in into somebody's soul. Cause there's those practices where I don't know if you've ever been to like meditation retreats or whatnot, but like you can, sometimes you have a, a moment where you're challenged to stare at somebody in their soul for so long. And then it's like, what do you, the things that go on, it's just like, wild is weird because it's so almost forced in a way that's like unnatural but there's energy to that and there's a lot to explore with those things the energy. especially now that we're going to be all like virtual chatting through like weird 3d renderings or like i'm surprised we're not all mid-journey talking through this like i feel like that's what the future is going to look like well it, it'll be um it'll be walking past a shop and the whole the whole front will just rearrange you know based on your artistic profile and oh boy that's a bit scary but. and people that, auction yeah. off auction off those looks <laughs> by the minute that sounds <laughs> magical almost though and i'm a little bit excited for it in a uh hesitant and kind of scared but very excited way 
my goodness. It, yeah. It'll make everything more fun, right? Because it'll all be tailored to you. I'm You're ready. Like, oh, that looks nice. <laughs> I know. I feel like, you know, us in this world, I feel like we're all here for a reason. And, and we're and we, we kind of manifest at this time because it's so fun and so strange. Or like we're luckily like in this place where we could explore these things. I feel very thankful for that. Well, this has been amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Giselle. Yeah, uh, thanks. I've got a long thanks. list of questions that we didn't even oh, <laughs> didn't boy. get to at all. I but and I didn't even get to talk about any of the art I've been doing. <laughs> 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 well, well, really? Well, no, actually, like there's a few, like the chain. You know, the pieces, the piece on the chain. That's wild. Uh, talk about art that's specifically blockchain oriented, where it's like the hash marks are even connecting us as an art, as a collective, like between the pieces the nfts that's really fun one that sounds awesome do you want to talk about that um the chain it's a okay (laughs) yeah talk talk, talk about it we 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 loved you talking about the moon but we got the sense that they got the sense that it's not quite ready for i know oh my god i know i felt like it maybe, maybe the chain is um so so tell 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 us about that i i I um I took a sneak a sneak peek at your website, obviously, to to get a sense of your art, and um and uh, I saw some of your still life and and blowing up handbags with paint. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fire, uh, paint, anything. <laughs> yeah, the fire one, the fire one was particularly striking. <laughs> um, but t- tell us about the chain. I didn't see that one. I didn't see that one on there. Ah, uh, so the chain is. It's the people behind it, uh, you know, Factory Paris, NFT Factory Paris, Benoit, Tiutian, and uh, Albertine Meunier are in this company called um, OX4Art. Mm-hmm. And they launched The Chain. The Chain is, a, is an interesting project because it's a collaboration where it's, it's like the old school drawing collaboratives. And one person draws on a, on a piece of paper. They fold it to hide it. And then the next following part is done by the other artist. So this idea of the Squizzit Corpse has been on for a long time, been around since I think before the 60s even. Um, this thought is now on on what's called the project called The Chain. And, it, and it's like the block zero was started. And it's like it's a visual chain. It's like each minted artwork on it is is making a, a ongoing um, hash mark chain number where each piece is is linked in there and and the information of each artist that made each nft is throughout and they're going to have like like each artist is able to make forks out of this chain and um then make supporting artworks to this to this chain it's really crazy and you know i i was even i was even the third or fourth artist on the chain and it wasn't until I feel like a month ago that I that I heard them speak about it again. And I really fully conceptualized like what this means. Like this is like a visual blockchain. It's a very different um, thing than any other NFT project that's ever been done. So it, it really does uh, stand out to me. Um, something that probably won't be understood by others for another few years. I feel like it always takes a while for people to catch on to like the, the genius behind certain things. So that's something that that is ongoing and um, it will keep going. And it sounds like it's going to be um, up to the artist to choose the next and uh, as they develop and go on. So it's just an, never ending. And you're going to be able to like kind of research and like find all the artists through this network and then see other artworks that they've done in relation to that. That's, that's cool. a fun project. Yeah. We talked about so many things. Well, we, could carry, we could we could carry on. It's such an interesting yeah. subject, as you say, art is life, and like when when can you stop talking about that? Never. Never. Um, but yeah, fantastic. Um, yeah, it's just, been fun. It's, it's fun to you know from shooting the handbags <laughs> to like to shooting like everything from like the spark in the sky of like a distant planet now um yeah there's there's so much to to learn from and to to keep exploring with like we keep like we keep talking about i'm pretty i'm pretty jealous that you get to do this like (laughs) shouldn't we all be artists it sounds like it sounds like you have such an amazing time exploring your own mind 
um, and and bringing that forward. I, I don't feel like I do very much of that. I I, I do in a way through guitars and music, um, but but it's it feels like when when we have the conversation like this, it kind of feels like I it's what we should all be doing, <laughs> and we don't all get the opportunity to do it. Um, and um, and maybe maybe one of the great things about crypto is is that it it it, it can it can give you the opportunity but also the excuse to go and do it i think that's what one of the things that web3 in the nft space has given a lot of people um, giving the opportunities yeah and it, and it kind of puts everything on its head where in the past i was like always you know at the at the helm of of the commercial world and hoping they would hire me for things where it's like now is like the powers in my hands where it's like what audience do i want to be part of and like how you know where do I want to be seen in my ideal? Like, and I feel like, yeah, everybody should be kind of seeing that. Like where, what do you want to see? Where do you want to see yourself? And like, we manifest that. I've been so much into the idea of manifesting the reality and finding the time to do things. Cause you know, it's a lot of our habits take up a lot of time. So it's, you never, <laughs> you don't, you don't realize like where the time goes. And I've always been trying to make the most of my time because it's, it's the one thing that's the the most scarce. Well, on on that note, we should all head off and get back to painting and drawing. Yeah, and awesome. NFT and <laughs> this, Such this a fun has been, conversation. This has been really touching conversation. Yeah, thanks, Giselle. Thank you all. Have a great day. Before we thanks. go, actually, we need to announce that um, the next gerbil. We would like to announce the Quantum Light Gerbil, who is our next gerbil up for creation. And this will be done in collaboration with the community, who we are opening up the ability to create backstories for Quantum Light Gerbil. And their stories will provide the inspiration that will then allow you to paint us a picture in whatever format you choose to do, because you are so very multi talented to show us who quantum light gerbil is so as usual the community will provide backstories um, on twitter whether those are text form uh, we've got videos at this point any format who is quantum light gerbil what is important to them how can you paint us a picture oh i love it yes there is there is no possible way of knowing what these things turn out like it is so extraordinary the randomness uh, we are on gerbil number 36 this would be 36 gerbil, 36 different gerbils wow and um and and we've done we've done some great collabs in the past i think our our favorite our favorite one um was the swinging gerbil um the, pending gerbil the, the pending gerbil that's my favorite one that was amazing with hackatow yeah and hackatow <laughs> did that um and so, and so, it's our way of sort of building a backstory as well to the podcast, and all, and 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 whilst also having the community collaborate and come back with all kinds of things. Even though on the last one, someone 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 said that I was a gerbil and mentioned Richard Gear, uh, and it, it was all got it a was bit censored. Weird. It, it was um, censored gerbil. And so, gerbil. of course, it lends uh, itself to maybe some uh, inappropriate censored topics. Yeah, okay, okay, <laughs> right. cool. Well, I think quantum light gerbil sense. sounds 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 like it's a little, little outside of that sphere. <laughs> it's a little safer. <laughs> I'm all for it. Yeah. So, I'm quite interested as to. I suppose you have the whole range of possible formats in which you could create the quantum light gerbil. So that could play into uh, people's backstories as to how they sort of imagine this this going like if they can depict something with their words that creates a picture that maybe inspires you to create something i guess that that is their task right to inspire you to create the quantum light gerbil that's it, Love it. quantum light gerbil it seems like he has many timelines he's been yeah. through a lot <laughs> <laughs> he is we'll both find out. We'll existing find out. and not existing at the same time <laughs> <laughs> i'll pick his one spot <laughs> take him out of it and show you show you what he looks like I'm excited amazing for that. oh my goodness awesome right thank you everyone this has been so right. good um, thank you everybody great to talk all the best guys
Bye. 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 Thank you. Cheers. Purple